Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Child Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ashley Height today. So Ashley Height is a native of Cincinnati, Ohio. She attended Washington University in St. Louis, where she studied psychiatry, neuroscience, and philosophy with a minor in children's studies. Exploring her love for children, she taught in middle school in Newark, New Jersey at a charter school. This is where her spark for children's mental health was lit. She, was, she went on to attend medical school at the University of Chicago before moving to sunny Los Angeles to attend psychiatry residency at UCLA, where she fast-tracked to, to the child fellowship. She has always had a passion for maternal and infant mental health, school-based mental health, medical education, healthcare disparities, and minority recruitment in medicine. When not in the hospital, she does her best to maximize her pool and beach time, hanging out with family and enjoying all the food LA has to offer, most importantly brunch, watching reality TV, going to the movies and playing or watching sports. She particularly likes the Warriors and the Bengals. Uh, she has been an integral part of this program and is currently the co-chief fellow of our Child Psychiatry Fellowship with an area of distinction in parent and infant mental health. I can say personally that Dr. Height is a pleasure to work alongside and I'm excited to hear her discussion today. Dr. Height. Thanks so much, Dr. Tawaika, for that introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, I guess I'll go ahead and share my presentation. One second. Okay, so as advertised, today I'm going to be talking about conduct disorder. So just to uh, make it clear, I have no financial disclosures, hopefully one day, but not currently. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to submit throughout the presentation and we'll be sure to answer them at the end during the Q&A. Um, so first off, just going through what I hope you all take away from today's lecture. Um, I hope you're able to understand and differentiate conduct disorders from other externalizing disorders, um, being able to properly treat conduct disorders, understanding the socio-political context of co conduct disorders, and um, hopefully better understanding the association between social media and conduct disorders. Um, just a quick outline of what we'll go through today. Um, we'll first start off discussing externalizing problems and aggression, jump into some history of conduct disorder, how to diagnose conduct disorder, some of the neurobiology behind conduct disorder, um, risk factors, treatment, the relationship between social media and conduct disorder, and next steps. So I want to start off by sharing a story um, that actually led me to want to do my grand rounds on conduct disorder and the importance of knowing how to help and what to do. Um, to some people, these are the kids that get shuffled from place to place, from psychiatrist to psychiatrist, um, and tend to end up on the outskirts of schools, communities, and society, and just labeled as bad, uh, not capable of help, and overall stigmatized. So um, I have a cousin named David. I'm going to change his name for privacy reasons. But needless to say, he was unforgettable since the day he was born. I remember all my family in New York gathering for a family dinner at our annual Shinnecock Indian powwow. And after being told by his mom that he wasn't allowed to have dessert, I watched him, uh, I believe he was around 10 years old at the time, become enraged and proceed to use profane language towards her in front of everyone at the restaurant before just storming out. Um, I later learned from his mom that from the age of, I would say, about 12 to 16, he was shuttled from school to school due to repeated expulsions for disobedience and threatening behavior towards teachers and staff. And by the time he was 16, he had stolen from my aunt repeatedly, destroyed several cars and furniture, and my aunt had to make the difficult decision to actually send him to a designated boarding school for troubled youth when he, um, where he only lasted about, I'd say, four months. Um, at that point, feeling she had no other option, she quit her job sold her house, moved them both to Puerto Rico as a last ditch effort. She quickly realized that the situation had become out of her control. He had kind of reached his tipping point. And while living in Puerto Rico, he actually physically assaulted my aunt to the point where she ended up in the hospital, after which he was sent back to the States to live with his dad. As she was telling me the story, um, in conjunction with some of my personal experiences with him, I watched him have a lot of disrespect for authority, screaming all the time, destroying property, being very manipulative, disobedient, along with just going through a very messy uh, divorce between his parents. 
while thinking about all this, it kind of dawned on me that my cousin most likely was dealing with conduct disorder. Um, I watched my aunt kind of try to fight back her tears while she was sharing me the story and feelings within our family ranged from self-blame to just self-avoidance of the subject. So it really hit home for me how children with mental health issues are considered taboo in the African-American and Native American culture. And I recognize the cultural and religious perspectives that had influenced my own family stigma of mental health and that exists for families like mine. So looking down the line, she later tried to get him into therapy, but he was now 19 and refused as he was old enough to do so. Um, and his father was not able to manage either. So he sent him back to his mom two years ago. And sadly, one day they got into an argument. He became enraged, physically assaulted her once again. And her fiance, fiance tried to stop him. Um, the cops were called and in all the action, he actually refused to stop fighting, was unfortunately shot and killed. Um, although this may be a rare story, uh, it has stuck with me because there were so many steps along the way uh, that his trajectory could have been changed. And maybe he would still be with us here today, um, not only as my cousin, but as a son and a functioning member of society. So sorry to start us um, on a low note, but for me, my cousin's story was proof of the importance of studying and learning about conduct disorders and making sure we properly diagnose those who may be suffering from it despite the stigma attached so they can receive treatment um, they so desperately need and avoid ending similar to ending similar to David's. So this is not just a problem, you know, within our field. Childhood externalizing behaviors and juvenile delinquency is a societal public health issue. Um, in 2020, law enforcement agencies in the U.S. made about 420,000 arrests of people under the age of 18. Thankfully, that is 71% less than the number of arrests, arrests in 2011, but still higher of a number than I'd like. Also to note, homicide is the second leading cause of death among 15 to 24 year olds in the United States and the leading cause of death for young African-American males and females. Thus, violence prevention of all forms is one of the most pressing issues facing our society today. So when I think of this, or when we think of this within the mental health field, we think of children who have issues with externalizing, right? And directing their issues outward. We think of bullies that seem more present than ever before in the schools. Disruptive behaviors are associated with all forms of psychopathology in children and adolescents, but their problematic behavior is related to difficulty modulating impulsivity, self-control, and aggression. Um, those things result in rule breaking, threats of safety to others, disruption of social norms, and oppositional, aggressive, and hyperactive behaviors that are present in early childhood can actually often predict negative mental health outcomes later in life. Those include from school failure, to substance abuse, and even criminality in some cases. So I wanna focus in on aggression, which is a significant, um, well, there's a significant component of aggression that consists of physical or verbal behaviors that harm or threaten to harm others. Um, sometimes aggression can be appropriate and self-protective, or at times it can be destructive to the self and others. So aggression is actually more often seen in boys with boys displaying more physical aggression and girls displaying more relational aggression. Um, I wanna highlight there are two forms of aggression, both hostile and instrumental. Hostile aggression is also known as affective, um, impulsive, or what we call hot-blooded. Um, it is typically a response to aggression initiated by others, albeit it can be uncontrolled. It's more emotionally charged. Um, and the key to this form of aggression is that it causes injury or pain to the victim with little or no advantage to the aggressor. Um, and on the other hand, we have instrumental aggression, which is also known as predatory, uh, proactive, or cold-blooded aggression. It's more controlled, it's more purposeful in nature, um, and it has no, no emotion. That is what makes it very different from the hostile form. The aggression seems to be more manipulative in nature and is used to achieve a certain goal. It's a form of displaying domination and control over others. So with conduct um, disorder, aggression seems to be more instrumental. Uh, and with aggression in general, the early onset childhood aggression is the strongest predictor of later convictions. And I want us to keep that in mind as we go through this. So just wanna give a little bit of history about how conduct disorder came about in the DSM. So in 1952, it was actually termed conduct disturbance in the first DSM, and it was under transient personality disorders. Uh, they had described it as someone who has symptomatic manifestations, including truancy, stealing, destructiveness, cruelty, sexual offenses, use of alcohol. And at this time and for many years, 
the DSM had actually employed a primarily behavioral-based model for these presentations. It was actually not until 1980 uh, that conduct disorder was introduced in the DSM-3 and started to become more defined. Um, they defined it as including cases where there was repetitive and persistent patterns of aggressive or non-aggressive context um, conduct that violated the rights of others or violated major age appropriate societal norms or rules, okay? And at that time in the DSM-3, they broke it down into four subtypes. So under socialized, aggressive, and non-aggressive, and socialized, aggressive, and non-aggressive. And at this time, a researcher named Robbins <coughs> was looking into several antisocial behaviors of childhood. It was at this time that researchers started to realize that there was prognostic significance in the presence or absence of social attachments. So moving along, we got to 1994. This is when the criteria we know of today were created and conduct disorder was moved to be under the category of attention deficit and disruptive behavior disorders and was now um, being coded based on the age of onset and severity. So the criteria include, um, as we uh, know them now, to have the repetitive and persistent patterns of behavior where the basic rights of others or societal norms are violated. And you have to have three or more criteria being met in the past 12 months with at least one criteria present in the past six months. So those criteria include aggression to people and animals. So these are ones that they'll come in and tell us that Parents will say they see their kid mess, pulling the dog's tail all the time, uh, maybe setting animals on fire, killing animals, hurting people, um, bullying others, initiating a lot of fights, um, using weapons that can cause serious physical harm to others, right? Also having destroyed property. So fire setting or destroying other people's properties in other ways. Um, having, being very deceitful or stealing, um, breaking into someone's house, lying um, to con others, stealing items of non-trivial value, okay? And the last criteria is having serious violation of rules. So for example, these are the kiddos who parents say um, they don't come home at night um, despite being told to. Um, and that has to occur before they're 13, right? People who've run away from home overnight at least twice or being truant, not showing up to school, skipping out on school before 13 years old. So you need three or more of those criteria in the past 12 months and then one in the past six months. Okay, so that's the first part. And the second part is that the disturbance of behavior, like all of our um, uh, diagnoses, it has to be causing clinically significant impairment and specifically for conduct disorder to be, to qualify for the diagnosis of the antisocial personality disorder, you had to have met this criteria before 18 years old. So that is how you get the diagnosis of conduct disorder. And then they included um, coding it based on age. So childhood onset type, you have to have at least one symptom before 10 years old. And adolescent onset, onset type, you have to have absence of criteria before 10 years old. If the parents are unaware, then we say it's unspecified. And then we also code by severity. So you can have mild severity, moderate severity, or severe severity, and that's based off the amount of harm caused to others. So then in 2013, the DSM-5 came along and they moved the diagnosis of conduct disorder to the disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders class. And they actually added a very important specifier called limited pro-social emotions. Anyone who was lucky enough to listen to the recent presentation by our Cantwell speaker, Dr. Paul Frick, um, he spoke in much detail about the specifier of limited pro-social emotions and its significance, and that it is a more difficult presentation to treat, and it's actually a different type of conduct disorder. Um, an individual with this specifier must have displayed at least two of the following characteristics I'm doing, going to describe, and they have to display have displayed them persistently over at least 12 months and in multiple relationships and settings. So those characteristics include lack of remorse or guilt. So these are the kids who do not feel bad or guilty when they do something, something wrong. They show a general lack of concern about the negative consequences of their actions, and they do not care about the consequences of breaking rules, okay? So the second one could be that they're callous, have a lack of empathy. So essentially they disregard and are unconcerned about the feelings of others. They can sometimes be described as cold and uncaring, um, the person appears more concerned about the effects of his or her actions on themselves rather than their effect on others, even when they result in substantial harm. They are essentially unconcerned about performance. They do not show concern about poor problems or poor uh, performance at school, 
work or in any other important activities, and they typically blame others for their poor performance. And lastly, they have shallow or deficient affect. So these kiddos do not express feelings or show emotions to others, except in ways that seem very shallow, insincere, superficial. Um, they're the ones that we feel like they can turn their emotions off, off and on really, really quickly. Um, and they often use their emotional expressions uh, for gain. So their emotions will be displayed to manipulate or intimidate others. So I wanna show a quick interview um, of a mom and a child uh, who has conduct disorder. What kind of trouble? Shame led by Alex and Burton burned a bond. It was an accident. The police investigation found they used two gallons of fuel to set it. Whatever they were cheating. Then they dumped cement powder into the gas tank of one of their teacher's cars. Not funny. Join the over 300 universities, colleges, medical schools. Okay, so just want to wanted to show that briefly because I think that it um, highlights, although that was a uh, a um, one second. Just want to get this back. Okay. Although this was uh, clearly actors, um, it kind of I think highlighted a few things. Um, how he was disrespectful of authority, had a lot of inappropriate ethic, right? Laughing at inappropriate moments, um, harming others would not be typically deemed as funny. Um, and how he also destroyed property um, along with several other uh, criteria I think he was meeting. So an article was recently published in April, actually in the Orange Journal that was related to conduct disorder. It detailed three personality dimensions that were observable from an early age. Um, they had a genetic basis and each domain was related to conduct problems and delinquency. Those three dimensions were grandiose manipulative, callous unemotional, and daring impulsive. So looking at those, grandiose manipulative and daring impulsive traits were predictive of not only higher levels of pro-social behavior or, or social competence, but also higher aggression and violent delinquency. And those were independent of conduct problems. Whereas callous unemotional traits predicted low levels of social competence and pro-social behavior independent of conduct problems. These findings actually help to demonstrate that the specifiers are predictive of different outcomes, right? Independent of conduct problems, which has been argued to form that basis for developing those specifiers we spoke of earlier, specifically the limited pro-social emotions. We know that personality stability in children has been shown to be moderately stable. Um, so it could be an important developmental time frame to consider traits and possibly be more treatable during childhood and adolescence. We're hoping that the addition of that specifier allows for better understanding and more consistent results and to better help understand conduct disorder at a more individual configuration. And with this, um, more having more individualized diagnosis, it can help with crucial clinical decision-making tasks such as forecasting behavior, planning treatment, evaluating treatment, and estimating prognosis. So I'm sure we're all very familiar with the differential diagnosis for conduct disorder. Um, it includes oppositional defiant disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, ADHD, DMDD, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorders, adjustment disorders, substance use disorders, PTSD. Several, several of our disorders can have similar presentations to conduct disorders. But one thing I wanna mention is that it is very common um, to see uh, conduct disorder be comorbid with other diagnoses, particularly ADHD. About 20% of kiddos with conduct disorder also have ADHD, along with um, substance use disorder, major depressive disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder, which rank, have a range from about zero to 40%. And just wanna make it clear that it does overlap with ADHD, but what differentiates it from conduct disorder um, is that individuals with elevated psychopathic traits are not known to have problems with attention, more so problems with impulsivity. And that impulsivity is different in that it has more of a risk-taking and daring propensity to it rather than the impulsivity we see with ADHD. So let's talk about the epidemiology of conduct disorder. So conduct disorder symptoms are the most common primary presenting problems for psychiatric referrals among kids in the US. 
Also, youth with diagnosed conduct disorder have a higher degree of distress and impairment in almost every domain of living compared um, with youth with other mental disorders. There's a seven to 10% prevalence of conduct disorder in the US with a worldwide prevalence of 3.2%. So also makes me wonder why is it higher here? Um, there's a gender disparity with more males than females being diagnosed. And the median age of onset is about 11.6 years old. Um, and to note, if a child is diagnosed with early childhood onset child uh, conduct disorder, it results in greater risk for them developing persistent difficulties in adulthood and is highly predictive of impulse control disorders in adulthood, including substance use disorder and antisocial personality disorder. According to current data, um, Caucasian children are more likely to be diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, whereas African-American children are actually more likely to be diagnosed with conduct disorder when presenting with similar symptoms. And so as we can see, there's a bias in diagnosis from several arenas. Um, ethnic bias, conflict and prejudice contribute to aggression at all levels. Um, I would be remiss to not discuss uh, this as an important dynamic within this diagnosis. To help display this a little more elegantly, a study was done by Rick Kukumer Patel and Associates looking at uh, demographic predictors and comorbidities in hospitalized children with conduct disorder. So in this study, there was a total of 32,000, um, about 32,000 children, all under 18 years old with a primary diagnosis of conduct disorder. The important takeaways were that they found that African-American children under 11 years old have a five times greater chance of admission for conduct disorder compared to other um, adolescents. African-American males are actually more likely to be admitted for conduct disorder. They also found that children with conduct disorder from low-income families, so those would be those deemed under the 50th percentile, have a 1.5 times higher likelihood of inpatient admission compared to higher income families. And these children have about 12 times higher odds of comorbid psychosis and a seven times higher odds of depression. And that's compared to the comparison group, right? So having those uh, comorbidities may further deteriorate the severity of their illness and is what may lead them to have more acute inpatient care needs. So the researcher went on to ask what might be at play to lead to these results. So first, first and foremost, there's implicit bias that we all are very aware of that exists not only in society, but within the mental health field as well. There's implicit bias in the education system where there's a lack of equal educational opportunity. There's um, culturally biased assessment tools, Teachers' perceptions definitely differ according to race, and that has been consistently shown in several studies. Um, it has also been shown that this bias, along with risk factors that I'll discuss more in detail later, can lead to the development of this disorder. Also, you know, the cultural impact on parenting behavior is um, more so seen in African-American families as parents are more likely to apply physical punishment and engage in, emotion, in emotional withdrawal um, more so than other races and ethnicities, since they place more value on obedience. Um, thus, they teach pain and coping skills to their children and prepare them to tackle pain and disappointment instead of being protected from such factors. Morgan and Associates found that African-American parents of low socioeconomic status mostly teach their children how to survive, like coping with racism, rather than teaching quieting behaviors. So when thinking a little more deeply about like, what is going on? How is this happening? What is happening in the brain? There are a few hypotheses. Um, there's the biosocial interaction model, which is thought that uh, there's both genetic and environmental contributions that go toward creating this aggressive behavior. This was highlighted in the study of 1500 pairs of Swedish and British twins, where they found that aggressive and non-aggressive antisocial behaviors have both environmental and hereditary influences. And I think that goes to stand for most of our diagnoses where they have both um, genetic and environmental contributions. And to note, impairments in emotional regulation and inhibitory control may be key predictors of disruptive behaviors. So the other hypotheses known as uh, the dysregulation hypotheses um, sh shows that disruptive behaviors can be induced by the failure of top-down modulation, right, of neural areas that are implicated in emotional response. So as we discussed, there are different types of aggression with cold aggression being associated with psychopathic traits. There are functional impairments seen in that the amygdala is underactive and there's less autonomic arousal. So these kiddos have impaired processing of distress cues, which results in impaired learning about actions that harm others. And they have impaired predictor error signaling, which involves the striatum. 
So essentially their aggression is without emotion or remorse because they have that they're, they don't have that empathy. It isn't stopping them from hurting other people. Their right amygdala is um, underactive. So therefore everything is calculated. How can this suit me? Okay. And then on the other end, we have hot aggression. They hypothesize this there that there's not enough regulation of the amygdala by the prefrontal cortex, resulting in what we would see an, as an overactive amygdala, amygdala, leading to uh, more impulsive aggression that we tend to see in PTSD and ADHD. Um, they are much more likely to act without thinking. Um, and this is sometimes termed hypofrontality. So now thinking about what are some of the risk factors that you know, lead us to conduct disorder. And there are several early risk factors, including paternal and maternal pathophysiological factors, maternal malnutrition, illness during pregnancy, smoking, using drugs and alcohol during pregnancy, birth complications and genetic predispositions um, to externalizing behavior from mom and dad. So there's things happening before a kiddo even comes out of the womb that can put him at risk for these developing of um, disruptive behaviors. And the likelihood of later developing externalizing behaviors would be strongly increased when the biological risk factors are combined with social risk factors. And you know, these risk factors can be made up of someone's individual disposition, which can include low verbal and social skills. They can have difficult or disinhibited temperaments and a family history of externalizing disorders. Those, that disposition, right, combined with certain environmental factors, such as having a high conflict family, um, having a lot of rejection by pro-social peers, experiencing a lot of academic difficulties or living in an unsupportive community can lead to externalizing problems. Again, Collins identified that the three key characteristics that differentiate children at risk are the difficult or disinhibited temperament, having a family history of externalizing disorders, and having behavioral and academic difficulties. And this is important to note because there's a high societal cost of adult externalizing behaviors. Thus, it is ever more important to intervene and ideally prevent problems behaviors. And it, uh, I guess ideally prevent problem behaviors before severity rises to the level of criminality. Um, there have been some longitudinal studies that have shown that externalizing problems in childhood predict subsequent academic difficulties in childhood and adolescence over and above prior academic competence. So it has been demonstrated that lower academic competence in early childhood was associated with greater internalizing, so more anxiety and depression problems while in middle childhood. But the issues, once they became to adolescence, became those, what was depression and anxiety, depression and anxiety now look more like externalizing problems. So if we look at that um, from a, biosocial format, we want to look into the home as well and how part of this behavior may have been learned. Parents may be unknowingly creating what is called a coercive cycle, where a child is learning that aggression is an effective strategy to meet their goals. Um, typically, such interactions are the result of children with a difficult or disinhibited temperament like discussed before. So these are the kiddos who are more difficult to soothe, have high emotional reactivity, have a lot of disinhibition, disinhibition um, and a lot of irregularity in the routine, routines, such as having a lot of difficulty sleeping or eating. And along with that, they have parents who are employing ineffective parenting practices, such as inconsistent discipline that ultimately reinforces these aggressive behaviors. So a common pattern is what we would see for a coercive cycle is a child acts out or demands something. The parents are gonna deny that request and instead demand compliance. The child will protest, become aggressive, and then the parents will respond by making threats or also becoming aggressive to again, try to coerce compliance. The child will then escalate, right? They're gonna get more aggressive and make more demands. And the issue becomes when the parent fails to follow through on their threats and ultimately gives in to the child's demands or fails to ensure the child terminates his or her disruptive behavior. So now this child has learned the solution to his or her problems is to get aggressive and they will ultimately, ultimately get what they want. So now what we have all been thinking, how do we help these kids and families? What do we do? And that is true. It's a combination of therapy and medications. And to start with some interventions, the earlier we intervene, the greater the likelihood of success and deflecting the trajectory towards persistent antisocial behavior. So conduct disorder is extremely difficult to treat because it is a very complex disorder with a wide range of symptoms as we discussed earlier. And these youth, youth tend to have 
multiple comorbid disorders and complicated home situations, which we also know to be quite common in our field, but is even more significant when it comes to this. So we wanna start by doing our initial interviews with them. We wanna gather a thorough history to ensure we're getting accurate diagnoses. We wanna ask about friend groups. Are they engaged in high-risk activities? This is important because conversations and social activities among friends who are both antisocial tend to be focused on the past and future commission of antisocial behaviors. We also wanna ask about family income as there's a, ca a causal association between family income and between family income and conduct disorder. So household family income is a critical risk factor for the development of early onset conduct disorder. And then we also wanna be sure to ask about empathy and remorse and or interview several people connected to the child as is necessary to make diagnosis. So as we discussed, therapy and meds are both imperative for treatment. And there are several different therapy models um, that can be employed. So there's parent training and support, fostering of pro-social skills. So that would be practicing emotional self-regulation, reducing sibling conflict, um, going into deviancy, deviancy training, improving pro-social peer affiliations. We also wanna help them promote school engagement and bonding. So that would be getting them more involved in extracurriculars, having additional instruction for those struggling academically. Um, and we, there's also parent-child interaction therapy. And then the last three, multisystemic therapy um, has moderate effect size um, in terms of uh, effectivity. And then there's communities that care and promoting school community university partnerships to enhance resilience. The one that we all think of, I think the most as it has the most evidence behind it is the multi-systemic therapy. Um, it is a community-based type of therapy. It's family driven and highly structured. Um, and it's used to treat these antisocial and delinquent behaviors in youth. And it typically ranges from about three to five months. The goal of it is essentially to empower caregivers to solve current and future problems. So in what is very different about this type of therapy is in that the client, so the multi-systemic therapy client is not just the youth. It's, it's the youth's entire environment. It's their family, their peers, their school, and their neighborhood. And this type of therapy involves behavior therapy, parent management training, CBT, family therapy, and meds. And with adherence to a full course of this type of therapy, it has been shown to decrease long-term rates of rearrest to decrease long-term rates of days in out-of-home placements, and improves family relations and function, and increases mainstream school attendance, and they have decreased adolescent psych symptoms, so important, along with decreased adolescent substance use, okay? So that is the, um, I highlight that one because it is so important, and I think the more kids we can identify and get into this sort of form of therapy, the more um, better results we'll see. And now in terms of medication, I'm curious, what would be your all's first choice of medication to treat conduct disorder? And a poll is gonna pop up on your screen here and I want everyone to select an answer. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to a minute. Imagine some Jeopardy music playing in the background. Okay, let's take a look at the results. All right, so it looks like we have alpha agonists, stimulants, and SSRIs at the top. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Awesome. So let's see if we all were right. So there's a paper by Siakam Associates that was published in Nature last year called The Psychopharmacological Treatment of Disruptive Behavior in Youths. This study was a systematic review using a network meta-analysis. And this type of analysis allows for the estimation of relative effects of interventions without direct comparison by integrating direct and indirect data from randomized controlled trials in a network. So in this study, they looked at comparing various psychotropic meds targeting symptoms of disruptive behaviors in youths by comparing 55 randomized control trials, which included about 6,000 patients um, that ranged from two to 20 years old with an average age of seven years old. Um, they looked at the meds prescribed and investigated their efficacy based on their mechanisms of action. And they actually targeted four symptoms that they deemed representative of disruptive behaviors, including aggression and hostility, impulsivity, conduct problems, and oppositional defiant problems, okay? So again, they studied these meds based off their mechanism of actions, as you can see in the chart. 
Um, and you can see several were used, ranging from stimulants to anticonvulsants, GABA receptor agonists, and mood stabilizers like lith lithium. Um, and subjects in this network of randomized controlled trials were largely male, um, about 84% male, and the mean trial length was 57 days. Uh, the nine diagnoses included from most prevalent to least were ADHD, disruptive behavior disorders, uh, pervasive developmental disorder, bipolar disorder, autism, conduct, OCD, MDD, and ODD. Those were the main um, uh, diagnoses included. So here are the results of the network meta-analysis for disruptive symptoms. We're mainly going to focus on A through C. Um, the first graph, A, is a network graph. It represents the treatment arms included in the network for disruptive symptoms. And the thickness of the line shows the numbers of studies. So as you can see, there were more studies with norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors, um, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, ser serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and um, second generation antipsychotics. And this is a very important chart. This is a random effects model force plot that they use to compare each treatment arm versus placebo. Here you can see that second generation antipsychotics, stimulants, dopamine receptor modulators, and non-stimulant ADHD meds were the ones that were greater than placebo. Second, gener second generation antipsychotics had a standardized mean difference of 0.668. Stimulants had a standardized mean difference of 0.633. Dopamine receptor modulators had 0.402 and non-stimulant ADHD medications had a standardized mean difference of 0.386. Along with this, they went on to rank the medications, as you can see in plot C, um, for disruptive symptoms using super values. And it showed that second generation antipsychotics had the highest probability for being the most efficacious agent for disruptive behavior symptoms, um, followed by stimulants then dopamine receptor modula modulators, then non-stimulant ADHD meds, while obviously placebos ranked as the least efficacious in reducing these symptoms. Um, uh, chart D was a head-to-head -head comparison of the included agent groups, but for purposes of time, we're just gonna mainly focus on A through C. I think most importantly, what came from D was that there was a moderate effect size of second generation antipsychotics of 0.669 um, with, they used risperidone as their second generation antipsychotic in most of those studies. And it was the only one that was comparable um, to treatment of other primary and secondary symptoms of other disorders. Stimulants had a moderate effect size, but moderate effect size as well, but seemed to target largely symptoms of ADHD and all the other medications tended to have small to uh, medium effect size. So for treatment of disruptive symptoms based off of this study, um, there was a consistent finding that psychotropic meds with higher dopaminergic receptor affinity, including methylphenidate and risperidone, showed significant efficacy in reducing these symptoms compared to other psychotropic agents. So dysfunction in this dopaminergic system itself may play a significant role in youth's response to these medications. They both result in augmenting tonic dopamine, dopamine levels and reducing exaggerated phasic responses. Secondly, it's also possible that not only the stimulants, but also the second generation antipsychotics may directly affect top-down modulation by facilitating dopaminergic neurotransmission in the prefrontal cortex, even if they primarily affect the limbic system. So the order you wanna prescribe um, based off this would be second generation antipsychotics, then stimulants, then dopamine receptor modulators like Abilify, and then non-stimulant ADHD meds, which the one they had here was etamoxetine and always remembering to appropriately treat any other comorbid diagnoses as well. And so when we think about the poll results, I saw stimulants. Um, I saw also clonidine, which wasn't as shown to be as effective in this, in this study. But I think we always want to think about side effects, our kiddos full picture, to make sure we're choosing um, individualizing treatment and that um, although there is a pathway, it's going to depend on the person. So I wanted to play this quick video, just taking a look at uh, social media and how it affects our kiddos. It's, there's been that Surgeon General's warning on packs of cigarettes, but this morning, for the first time, a new warning about something else, social media and what it means for kids' mental health. Why now for this advisory? We're issuing this advisory to sound the alarm. Surgeon General Vivek Morthy says there's not enough evidence to show social media platforms are safe enough for kids and teens. We see rates of depression and anxiety and suicide and loneliness going up among young people. And I'm concerned that social media is an important driver of that youth mental health crisis. Uh, this is the defining public health issue of our time, youth mental health.
research shows 95% of teens are on social media. More than a third say they're on constantly. And teens spend an average of three and a half hours each day on these kinds of apps, something research shows can double the risk of experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety. The other day, my daughter uh, came up to my wife and I and asked us if she could post uh, a picture on social media. How old is my she? daughter is five years old. She's actually in preschool. Um, she's been hearing about this from her, her friends. All of the big platforms. So the reason I wanted to show that is because there's a surge of social media in the lives of our youth today. Um, we can see as young as five years old. Um, I felt it was important to know of any existing relationships between the use of social media and conduct disorder. Um, so there was actually a prospective cohort study done by the Nagata and Associates entitled Contemporary Screen Time Modalities and Disruptive Behavior Disorders in Children. In the study, participants reported an average of four hours of total screen time per day at baseline, much similar to what was reported in the video. And each hour of total screen time per day was prospectively associated with a 7% higher prevalence of conduct disorder and a 5% higher prevalence of ODD at one year follow-up. They showed that each hour of social media per day that a kid spent on social media was associated with a 62% higher prevalence of conduct disorder. And each hour of video chat, um, texting, television and movies and video games per day was associated with a higher prevalence of ODD. So when examining essentially thresholds, like what is the takeaway? Exposure to more than four hours of total screen time per day was associated with a higher prevalence of conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. Higher screen time was prospectively associated with a higher prevalence of new onset disruptive behavior disorders, and the strongest association was between social media and conduct disorder. That being said, this is not a randomized controlled trial, but it shows the deleterious effects social media may be having not only on the mood of our kiddos, but also their behaviors, okay? And that's something we want to be aware of, and I think more research could be done in this arena. So although there has been much progress in the study of externalizing behaviors, um, I think there's you know, more work to be done um, as the stigma is still widespread, particularly in certain communities. I hope that one day families like mine will be more accepting of resources to help kids who very much struggled like my cousin. Um, looking forward, there could be more prevention and intervention research aimed at reducing problematic antisocial behavior as it has been shown to be successful, um, particularly programs like the um, MST that target high-risk individuals and populations early in development and that focus on strengthening bonds to the socializing agents of family and school. Um, there could be more looking into long-term influence of child and adolescent prevention and intervention programs on adult outcomes. Um, there's currently limited research into addressing how sibling focus can be incorporated into prevention and intervention efforts. And also, I think there could be more age-specific targeted interventions and preventions, like how early is early enough? Is five too early? Should we be doing these things when they're three, six? There's not a lot of evidence in regards to that. And also, um, I think there could be further assessment of implicit bias from teachers, schools, and environment, and how that's impacting our kids' um, behaviors and academic success. And then also encouraging involvement in extracurricular activities as it seems to reduce the risk for persistent externalizing problems, both by providing structure and alternative to antisocial activities and by fostering ties to school contexts. So that is the um, end of my presentation. And um, if anyone has any questions, I'm available. Thank you so much, Dr. Haidt. Yeah. Uh, that was an incredible talk. I, I think, you know, personally, I was very struck by by your own personal story. Um, additionally, you know, being on the inpatient service, we are consistently answering questions to families with kids with these sort of externalizing and aggressive problems about screen time. Mm -hmm. How much is too much? Um, you know, what kind of things should we be limiting? So I know that a lot of that research is underway. So I, I so appreciated the talk. I think it's very timely. Um, we've got a bunch of questions in the Q&A, um, so I'll go ahead and just jump right in. Mm -hmm. um, so this first one is, uh, given the racial disparities in diagnosis, what are your thoughts on whether the current diagnosis is primarily useful and valid, accurate, but a problem of application, diagnosis, and bias, or a problem of the diagnostic criteria itself? 
I think it's a combination of all of the above. Honestly, I think the bias comes from perception. So as we know, as I was talking about the studies in the classroom, simply if you were to um, have a teacher with the and kids present the same way and one be white and one be black, the kid is going, the, uh, the teacher is going to um, make an observation that the African-American child is having lower performance, is performing inaccurately, their facial expressions are often misconstrued, language is misunderstood, leading, um, I think, to not only misdiagnosis, but misinterpretation. So it could be that the criteria are correct, but they need to um, be uh, uh, performed maybe by uh, African-American researchers to be able to identify if certain presentations are aligning with um, what we're looking for, right? So if is this bullying or is this play? Is this how they're talking? Is this their dialect, right? Is that intimidation or is that just the language they use in their community? So I think there's a lot of misinterpretation of presentation um, leading to the overdiagnosis. Um, I know personally there was a case on the inpatient unit that I had that we had a, a kid who was excellent. He was a national shot put thrower, having a lot of difficulty controlling his emotions. And we um, were going to diagnose him with conduct disorder. Um, luckily, I was on the team and was able to describe some of his symptoms as symptoms of depression, trauma. This kiddo had been sexually molested. And what he really was suffering one from was PTSD depression, anxiety, and didn't know how to express his emotions. And simply when he moved in with his father, we got him involved in boxing because that was something he really enjoyed. And his symptoms dissipated. Within a month, dad said he was doing great. So being able to identify um, the symptoms at a deeper level, right? That's where I say we need to um, be able to speak to teachers, communities, um, being involved and engaged and understanding that we have this implicit bias and asking ourselves, what am I really seeing? Really seeing? And am I qualified to make the diagnosis based off that. Yeah, you also really kind of highlight the importance of having a, a diverse treatment team mm -hmm. as well, right? So mm -hmm. um, kind of thinking back to your your introduction in terms of, you know, increasing minority students and diversity in education, I think, you know, it's kind of like full circle. Exactly, exactly. Okay, um, next question that we have here is, <clears throat> excuse me, the biological and environmental risk factors, as well as behaviors that you describe, are present in individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Could you speak to the research and treatments that consider this diagnosis? Yeah, so I think um, I didn't particularly look into this in regards to this presentation, but as we know, fetal alcohol syndrome has a lot of impulsivity difficulties, right? And we know that they're very difficult to treat. Um, a lot of it is uncontrolled. They, I think, have a lot of that more so I would say that cold aggression because they do tend to have empathy. And I think that's what differentiates them from those with conduct disorder. Um, but in terms of treatment, I think it's one of those cases where we do kind of throw a lot of meds at them and don't see a lot of results, right? And I think it's one of the arenas where it's hard to diagnose, right? We don't know, moms don't always say that they were using. Some of these kids are adopted, right? We don't know if they, they might have the uh, presentation, the the, the dysmorphic, dysmorphic facies, but we can't always identify if they actually were exposed to alcohol, right? So that is what makes that uh, diagnosis in general complicated. And I think it's one of the hardest things to treat because I think a lot of it is, like we said, in the brain, right? That top-down um, uh, modulation difficulties for those kiddos. And I think the best we can do for them is get them the behavioral treatments as much as possible um, because we have found a lot of our meds not to be as effective with them. Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions here for you. Uh, what do you see as the main barriers in treating youth with conduct disorder? I know, I know there's probably a handful. Uh, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think if I had to pick, I'll go with three. Um, I think one barrier is lack of access to mental health care. Um, for instance, I was just in African American community in African American community communities and low income communities. So that includes several um, races and ethnicities. There aren't as many providers. Uh, there's a lot of stigma surrounding it. I was just um, actually um, self uh, disclosure, but interviewing at a, a clinic in Compton, and they were saying that they just can't get clients. And we know the clients exist, but they're just not aware or not uh, open to coming to the clinic. So I think that's step one. So we need to get our feet in there, get into schools, make ourselves known, um, and into community clinic churches in places where the kids are, right? Um, so I think that's the first barrier, access. 
I think the se second barrier would be just overall stigma about giving the diagnosis um, and uh, being afraid to give it up because of what it carries. But I think it's preventing a lot of kids of getting the care they may need. Um, and lastly, I think um, it would be parents' lack of ability or lack of desire, I should say, to want to put their um, kids in these sorts of treatments. They involve their time consuming, right? And a lot of these parents, like we said, come from communities where they are um, dealing with a lot of other things. And to have to add another thing to the plate and involve all these other people is hard and complicated, right? It's hard for me to <laughs> show up to work and do all my work on time, right? I can't imagine having kids, jobs, and having to pay the bills and all those things, right, at once, along with a kid who is, like we said, a very difficult temperament. I'm trying to manage them with my other kids, where I think is why it's important that we also start to do sibling research. Um, so I think it's a, a, a handful of things. Um, along with society just making it very difficult to treat in general and also implicit bias. And I could go on. Uh, there's several barriers that I think are preventing successful treatment and diagnosis for conduct disorder. I, I so appreciate that. I have a I have a question that sort of lends itself to that, mm -hmm. which is this, this sort of um, sociopolitical context around it. And additionally, sort of the provider heuristic that can happen and the implicit bias. Mm -hmm racism mm -hmm. within the within the country. Um, and so something that has been on my mind, I'm just curious kind of what you think about it is, you know, for on, on the inpatient service, you know, sometimes we'll see kids who are 17 or on the precipice of turning 18 with this sort of presentation. And, you know, personally, I can't help but wonder that sometimes it's a judgment call that if, you know, if they're um, engaging in behaviors that, um, you know, are uh, they can be arrested for, for example, um, or they're being particularly aggressive in, in public for, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it can be a judgment call on behalf of the responding kind of agency. Right. Um, and so I'm wondering what we can do as mental health providers who are seeing kids who are older, um, like 17, yeah. al like almost 18, who present with this, if there's, if there's any thoughts that you've had kind of as you've prepared for this talk. And yeah. So I think for those kids on the precipice of becoming 18 and no longer being juvenile delinquents will become more so felons or misdemeanors. Um, my idea that I've always felt would be helpful would be those are the kids that we really need to link with adult mentors, right? So they may not want to connect with the mental health field directly, but mentors within their community. So if, you know, uh, people in their 20s and 30s that can relate to them still, but that are doing pro-social activities, right? Helping them to have those outlets, right? Building bridges with, to help them be more engaged in their community. As we know, people who feel like they have a purpose tend to behave a little better, right? Um, and when you're constantly being told your whole life, you're bad, you're not wanted, you're, un you're unaccepted, you're going to continue to do the behaviors that you feel make you, give you some sort of, um, um, feeling, make you feel happy or make you feel like you get attention. So helping them, uh, you find another way to express that, I think is one of the things I think of in getting them involved, um, their families involved as much as possible at this time, because it's the kind of the last, the last straw. Like I said, my cousin was 19 by the time my mom, or my mom, my aunt tried to get him in therapy and he was too late. Right. And even sometimes 17 can be too late because those kids are kind of already on their way out the door. But doing it's kind of like a, a last ditch effort to do everything we can. Um, and for me, mentors is probably the biggest the biggest thing I can think of that could be of some effect that can follow them, that they can text, because that's a little bit out of the realms of what we can do as a healthcare provider. Um, I think once they're that age, um, of course, assessing for comorbid things to make sure we're not missing anything um, that can be treated. But uh, at that point, I think trying to connect them with something important that they care about in their environment is the best thing we can do for them. Thank you. Okay, last question here. Uh, I think I can squeeze one more in. Let's see. Um, so you mentioned the like teaching how to survive as as um, you know something that uh, occurs in some families as well. And the way that you know that can sort of be conceptualized as like a symptom of minority stress. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you know of any public health initiatives to sort of support families that have layers of minority stress, racism, um, you know, limited financial resources to be able to access some of this care, anything that you, you know about the public health efforts. I know there's been a movement to create 
you know, incentives to help with this. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I know that it's something that um, the CDC and, and people have been working on pretty heavily. Um, I don't know of any specifics. I find myself Googling these things when I'm seeing patients um, to help as much as I can, um, whether that's during a session or after a session, sending them links. So I kind of, I think, you know, these type of nonprofit things they tend to be, tend to change relatively frequently. So I think it's an ever moving circle. So it's kind of, you have to look it up, but um, I'm hoping more and more things are being put out there because I think it's a problem that, of course, in this current political context that we all know of is not really improving all that much at the moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. I think that yeah. was our last question. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you again so much. It was a fantastic presentation. And um, and we can reach out with additional questions if any others come up. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.